Uh, uh, last Tuesday. Oh yeah, that's this. That was the start of uh, level three, right? Wait, I'm so lost. What week we are? Nice. That's good. I'm sure, some of you are probably itching to get back into work, and some of you probably not. <laughs> that would be me. Um, yeah. So just a quick update on. Uh, where we're at with like maybe going back to um, going back to night classes instead of doing these online sessions. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow or on Thursday. Um, so we're going to be talking about how we're going to approach getting back to level two. But as far as I'm aware, I think once level two hits, we will probably just get straight back into uh, night classes as they used to be. But yeah, I don't know. 100% but that's I I'm, I'm, think that's what's going to happen we'll probably just get straight back into it and I'm sure we'll probably have to um, you know just I don't know if we can stay too far away from each other because everyone's sitting next to each other but I think obviously just common courtesy not sneezing or coughing on anyone stuff like that um, but once I do know which hopefully will be tomorrow I, yeah, I will let you guys know uh, but yep yeah. We'll get on to this lecture now. Uh, at this topic, so we're, we're going over DC EMF generation. Um, next week we'll be doing AC, but just to let you guys know, this, this is quite a big topic. Um, so again, like last week, I have done sort of the, the key points, um, though I think I've, I've covered a lot more uh, in each subject than I did maybe uh, compared to last week's lecture. Um, but yeah, definitely do have a read over these notes on your um, e-learning site as well um, because that will help out a lot. Um, but yeah, we'll start. So, yep, I said next week we'll be doing AC EMF generation. But to quickly give you a, a quick idea, it involves coils of wire, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a coil of wire. Um, but for now, that's what we'll say. Coil of wire and a changing magnetic field. Um, this is also to do with magnets and their opposing um, poles. Um, but that's what we'll get into next week. That just hint, hint, that's important to know for now. Okay, so the first one we're going to cover is electrochemical. Now, I did, when I was starting to do this, I started drawing some uh, pictures. I kind of soon realized that it was a big mistake because it takes very long and probably you guys are thinking that it looks like shit. That's what I'm thinking as well. So, yeah, the ones online are a lot better. So definitely have a look at those images online for each one of these EMF generations. Um but the basic principle of this electrochemical um, EMF is we have two different metals here. So they have to be different uh, metals. They can't be the same. Uh, they've got to be conductors. So they're two different metal conductors, different metal conductors. And then we have a solution here. It's a electrolyte solution. Um, now, for now, we don't really need to worry about what the what type of metal it is or what electrolyte solution it is. Just that that's the basis of it. Um, so to begin with, uh, if you can imagine these two metals were not in the solution, uh, and then we we slowly lower them into the solution. Uh, when we do that, that's going to cause a, a chemical reaction within this, and it's going to cause the electrons to be stripped from one of these uh, metal conductors and deposited to the other one. So for this example, I've just used, uh, I've got a purple one here and a green one here. Uh, now this is arbitrary, it's, it's random, I've just made it up. Um, purple, green doesn't really matter. Um, but basically saying that the electrons are stripped from this purple here and they get deposited into this green uh, electrode here or metal conductor. Um, so this creates an imbalance within this system, within this um, electrolytic solution. Um, so if we were to connect an external circuit, so maybe a voltmeter here, um, what we, you would find is that uh, the electrons would start flowing from this green conductor 
through the voltmeter and back down here. Uh, so that's one form of EMF generation and that's just the basis of how it happens here. Um, this obviously happens, I should say, is it tries to rebalance um, the system. It happens with any sort of system uh, out there. Um, actually, pretty much everywhere in the universe, things want to rebalance themselves. Not many things like to be chaotic or out of balance. Um, but yeah, this, this here, it's actually, it's called a cell. Now, if you can imagine lots of very, very small ones of these, I'll go down to this next part. So imagine very small ones of those. Uh, you can add many of these to create a battery. So that, that's essentially a battery, this, this here. Um, you could recreate this yourself and create your own battery if you wanted to. I'm sure you could look online, on Google, uh, on YouTube. Um, but that's pretty much how a battery is made. Um, as it here, as, as we know, batteries either can or can't be recharged. Um, so that what that means is that there are some types of uh, electrolytic solutions uh, that can be recharged. They can charge up again, or others that when the chemical reaction starts, it will never stop. It will keep going until it's depleted, and that's it. You've got to throw it away after that. And that's where we get batteries that uh, either can or can't be recharged. Now, just a quick note, I know my, my writing is pretty terrible in here uh, today. Uh, for some reason, my pad was just playing up. I had to redo a, quite a lot of this, um, hence why I was a little bit late today. Apologies for that. Um, so we're just going to move on to the next one. So that first one was uh, electrochemical. Uh, next one is piezoelectric. I actually have no idea whether I'm pronouncing that right or wrong. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Um, so this is basically the principle of this is when you have a crystal and it gets squeezed or stretched. Now squeezed or stretched is very loose terms. Uh, squeezed, for example, could be you know a pressure being put on it. It could be a, a sound wave. So if you're speaking, um, that creates a, a sound wave that can technically squeeze the crystal or stretch. Obviously, that's that's generally pulling. Uh, but so it's not just it's not just physically just pushing on a crystal or stretching. That squeezed part can be a few different things, um, but anything that would compress it basically. Um, so when it is squeezed or stretched, it releases an EMF um, across its opposite faces. So across the opposite ends, um, I could draw something here. I'll maybe I just quickly will. Uh, this is going to be a very weird looking crystal. I know it's just a little circle. So the opposite ends being these two here. Uh, so you can imagine if you say put some wire here. Or maybe I'll write crystal one here. Crystal. I always say crystal. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, when it's compressed, a EMF is generated on uh, across its opposite faces and this example here I think it's the same one in, in your book but this a really good example is of a barbecue igniter so when you press the, the button uh, to ignite it it's you can imagine you're pressing on something uh, mechanically is squeezing on this crystal so when it's squeezed together it creates uh, EMF is generated and it creates an arc between this part here Okay, and that looks like a little smiley face now, but that's not, it's a, it's an arc. So from that point to this point, there's a little arc of electricity. Um, and then once that uh, happens, obviously in your barbecue you have gas, and that gas um, ignites. So that's how, how uh, a barbecue igniter works. So this EMF that between these faces can can reach quite high can reach six kilovolts which is very high especially compared to what we normally use but just remember you know at, at home when we've got 230 volts um, we can have a lot of current with that whereas this emf here it doesn't really have a lot of, of current behind it uh, for most applications um so another application is a crystal microphone 
So to dumb it down a little bit into a couple of sentences, when you speak, your sound waves squeeze the crystal and then an EMF is generated. Um, and I'll actually elaborate a little bit on that. I haven't elaborated too much here. But when you, you speak into a microphone, it squeezes that crystal, which causes a, a voltage. And then that voltage is actually sent into an amplifier. And it takes that uh, voltage, amplifies it, and sends it out to other parts, generally to, to speakers. And that's why I've written this sentence here. So this can also be used in reverse. And what I mean by that is, if we send a voltage into a crystal, then that can give out sound waves. So that's how we create the sound. So it goes, basically you start from one end, speaking into a microphone, that crystal gets compressed, which um, generates an EMF, a small voltage. Generally it's, it's small with um, uh, crystal microphones. Then we, that goes into an amplifier, which amplifies that voltage. And then that voltage is used again to, um, to go into the crystal, which then gives off sound. Um, that's usually for things like sirens, um, cause the sound is a little bit different, but we won't get into that side of things. Now, uh, but yeah, that's basically what a crystal microphone, uh, sorry, a crystal, a piezoelectric, excuse me, piezoelectric, um, EMF generation is. Sorry guys, just get a drink of water. Okay, the next one is static. Now, obviously, I'm assuming all of you know what static is. If you've never been shocked by static, I'd be very, very surprised. Um, so this is basically when two materials, and I've put in brackets here, sensitive, because of course you can imagine there are some materials that are very sensitive to static electricity, and there's others that aren't. Obviously, um, if you're buying computer components, they normally come in a little bag that is... Um, is static free or, or not very sensitive to static. Um, so bear in mind that some materials are more sensitive than, than others. Uh, but when those two materials are rubbed together, electrons are dragged from one to the other. That's basically it. It's just stripping electrons from one material to the other. Um, so I put an example here. So imagine you're in your car and as you get out of, uh, you're about to get out of your car, you start moving around your seat a little bit, maybe you're, you're getting stuff out of your, um, uh, from passenger seat or, or something like that. Um, basically, you can have static happen there. So electrons can be dragged from, from you onto the seat, which leaves you positively charged. And then when you're starting to get out and you, you touch the metal frame of your door, which is in turn earthed, so I've put that in brackets, the metal has to be earthed, if it's not then um, current won't flow, but yeah, basically you become positively charged, and then when you touch your metal door, current flows, because you're positively charged, and earth uh, is not, and current is flows through the door to ground. Uh, that can happen anywhere, so obviously I'm sure you've probably been uh, had a static shock in many places. It might just be a doorknob. Uh, trampoline is a good one. I think online they have a, a quite a good example of that. Um, yeah, so uh, static is also the reason for lightning. So cloud particles are positively charged to the point. Now this is uh, dumbed down a little bit, of course. Uh, they're positively charged to the point, so they get keep getting charged more and more and more. Uh, to the point that air becomes conductive. Now, to do that, it takes a lot of force, like so much energy, I should say. Um, but basically, when the air becomes conductive, that's when we get lightning. Lightning goes from the clouds, goes through the air, and then strikes Earth, or anything that is Earth. That's why, obviously, uh, you know, skyscrapers that have uh, that are very tall, um, they have earthing. I'm not sure what they're actually called, but they, the earth at the very top, they're basically lightning rods and lightning hits them there and then it's earthed so that nothing else around it would get shocked. Um, and as you can imagine, you guys can imagine that's quite a large um, voltage. So static can reach 10 kV plus. 
you can go 20 kV quite easily actually, even even higher. Uh, but it's it's generally always in the thousands of voltage of, of volts. Sorry, um, again, not very high um, current due to the nature of the generation. Uh, the dangers. Um, I didn't actually write down here. Obviously, there's um, one danger is lightning. That's you know pretty scary if you get shocked uh, hit by lightning. That's not very good. Um, but one, uh, two big things. One is you can damage electronics, and I've put in brackets. That's not a very good bracket. Um, sorry, guys, one sec. Um, so it destroys parts of an MCU. Now I won't get into too much of that detail. I was considering running this or not. An MCU, or you, you guys may have heard of something called a CPU within your computer. They all have um, little in and out ports which control lots of different things. But inside there, the um, connection is very, very small. The, the metal pieces they use are, are very, very tiny. So you can imagine a, a very high amount of voltage, and we talked about this, I think, when we were back at night school, um, that obviously voltage can destroy things as well. The The sheer force of, of the voltage can actually destroy those little parts. Um, so that's why static is, is dangerous for um, electronics. Um, and static can also ignite fuel or gas. So obviously in, in certain industries, um, that can be quite dangerous, as you can imagine. Um, another example of this is car painting. So I've put here, it helps paint hard, hard to reach spots through opposite charges. Now what that means is they basically charge the, the car. Um, let's just say it's positively charged. And then the paint is negatively charged. Um, this, when they when they spray the paint onto the car, um, through the positive and negative, this, sorry, I've got a really itchy guy. I, guys, apologies, sorry. Um, EMF is, is generated and that's, that's how they get to these hard to reach spots because obviously you're positive and negative attracted to each other. Um, and that also, I'm, believe it said that it, it spreads the paint out pretty evenly as well. Uh, that's not too important, just a small example. Okay, so photoelectric. I've put in capitals here, solar panels. So you guys all know about solar panels. Um, maybe some of you guys have installed them before. I personally haven't. I've done a lot of the um, running wires to, to them. Um, it's switchboard work for them, but I've never actually installed them on a roof. Um, but basically the way it works, and again, I'm not sure how this is pronounced, selenium. So selenium is the top, top part of the uh, solar panel layer. So obviously you can imagine a solar panel has uh, many different layers within it. Um, selenium releases free electrons when light hits it. So, you know, it's sunny, the light hits it, uh, this uh, releases free electrons. So what that does is it makes the layer underneath it, uh, which is a, a thin bit of gold, um, that becomes negatively charged. And then beneath that is another layer of a, just a metal base that becomes positively charged. So when you connect it up to a circuit, that's how we get EMF generation. Um, when it's connected, its uh, voltage will, and current will flow. Um, but the voltage, you can see here, produces about 300 to 400 millivolts um, on average. So that's an average number. And then of course, that depends on the size, the make, you know, so what is it made of, um, how big it is, uh, the technology. There's a lot of different ones out there um, and a lot of different systems as well. Um, another uh, application, and this is used uh, quite a lot for photographers. Um, they have things in their cameras called illumination meters, so that you, you can imagine um, if you've ever uh, had a, I don't know, semi decent, actually, most cameras have them. Um, you know, it lets you know how much sunlight there is, what's the illumination of, of 
the picture, what's going on around you, and it can use certain filters to help that out. Um, so that's why it's quite important for photographers and their cameras. Not so much for me who uh, hardly ever take pictures. Anyways, okay, so the next part and the last part, I believe, so not too much longer, guys. Um, this is thermoelectric. Um, so basically when we have two different metals again, um, welded together. Now the reason for this two different metals, if anyone is wondering, they have to have like, a, a, it's not exactly, I'm going to use the word potential difference, um, but you can imagine the make of most um, metals have different um, characteristics. So say some are very good at being conductors, some are very good at being insulators and things like that. If you have two that are the same, there's just no potential difference between the metals. And that's the reason why we have to use different metals. Uh, but not to confuse you too much, the potential difference just means different characteristics. Okay, so when we have two different metals uh, that are welded together, um, that should say then, uh, then heat is applied to this welded area and EMF, uh, EMF is generated at the ends of the metal. So you, say you've got uh, two pieces, I'll quickly draw this again. So over here, uh, I'm just gonna do this very vaguely. So this little box, I'm just gonna scribble it in. That's the weld. It's got two different types of metals. Um, and I'll just say ends. Because a little bit, I know that's a very terrible um, illustration. But I'm hoping you guys get the point. So the two metals are welded together here. Um, I'll actually just do, actually I won't do that. Uh, so heat, that's what I'll do. I'll say heat is applied to this area, the welded area. Um, this creates an EMF here, these two ends here. I know this is quite strange, and, and to be honest with you, I don't actually know quite a lot about thermo um, electricity. I've never come across it or used it in my own personal life. Um, but you can imagine, like all oh, EMF generations, um, so when that's heated, and we we have sorry guys, I'm gonna start again. Um, where am I? Okay, so when the heat is applied to this part here. EMF is generated and we can we can put a circuit over here and that's that's basically how this works. That's actually it. Yeah. Um, a few points about this part. The heated part is called the heated junction, which is this bit here, and I guess a little bit of here. And the external circuit, so I'll just draw this as well. I'll just do V for a voltmeter just for now. Again, sorry, that's such shitty a drawing. Um, that's called the cold junction, so that's actually not the hot part. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory, I, I think. Um, so that system is called a thermocouple. Now, we don't really use this for, you know, say household uh, generation, um, EMF generation, I should say, because you can see here, it generally only emits about 20 to 40 millivolts. It's not producing very much. So we can't really use it for a whole bunch of applications. But for one good application, um, now you guys remember we have thermoresistors and, and say you had a AC system and it, um, it obviously wanted to sense how hot the room was. It used those thermoresistors to, um, or thermistors to uh, detect how hot or how cold it is and, and then from there changes its temperature for whatever you um, put in on the remote. Um, a similar one to that except a, a slightly different situation is called a thermoelectric pyrometer. It's a similar uh, concept to the the AC you know detecting how hot something is. It does the same thing it, this device uh, is used to measure the high temperatures of molten metals. Now, that's a very big key word there. 
uh, 2000 degrees or so. So that's, that's a bit different to a thermo, a thermistor wouldn't work in this situation. We need a different type of uh, system and a, a uh, thermoelectric system is, is the way to go for this because you can use some metals that can withstand 2000 degrees. Uh, maybe it's a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, uh, but we can use metals that can withstand that. And uh, so when that temperature changes, and this is obviously, you know, to do with uh, sensors and they're, they're, they've got their molten metal and they're obviously they're making something or doing whatever um, to it. They want to know when temperature changes. Um, so when the temperature changes, the voltage does as well. Hence the meter can detect temperature changes. So basically it's, it's there to detect how the temperature changes of very, very hot molten metals. Um, that's actually all I have today for you guys. Um, I just wanted to quickly write down, cause I forgot to do this at the beginning. I can't remember. Considering I came in halfway, well, a little bit into your academic year, I can't remember whether you guys have been shown AC and DC um, generation, like the difference uh, on a graph. Does anyone know whether you guys were taught that before I came along? The difference between AC and DC? If anyone can pop that in the chat. Yeah. Okay. If you guys are all comfortable with that, that's, that's good. Obviously, if anyone's not, um, could always look it up. Jake showed you. Okay. Perfect. Cool. That's good. Okay. Uh, in that case, then I don't think there's anything else that we need to go through. But yeah. Next week will be about, um, AC EMF generation, which is a little bit more interesting in, um, in my eyes. Oh, you want me to show it? Yep. Yeah, I can do that. That's no worries. I was just going to give a quick, um, quick example. I think I did actually show you a little bit at the beginning. Um, I'm just going to show you using two graphs. So this is going to be DC. This is going to be voltage. Uh, this is time. It doesn't matter how long, it's irrelevant. Uh, let's just say you had a generation of five, five volts. Uh, in a DC circuit, there is just going to be one straight line. So all these DC um, EMF generations, are basically, they're always going to be the same. It's always the same output. Um, whereas AC stands for alternating current, hence the alternation. Um, a common one uh, that used in our households, uh, it's actually, it's called a sine wave. Uh, so this is a positive part. And that's a negative part there. So you can see the difference here in DC, if we had five volts out, it would just stay at, at five volts for the whole time. Whereas AC, it'll alternate. So it, a sine wave basically starts off at zero. That's a zero. It goes up to its peak. Uh, if you wanted to know, that's just called V peak. Um, and then it goes through here. And this is called the positive cycle. This is your half cycle. And then for the next part of the cycle, it goes down to a negative cycle and then going back up again to zero. And this happens, uh, you know, continually over and over and over and over. And um, where in New Zealand, we have 50 Hertz. We use 50 Hertz, sorry, which means it's uh, 50 times, times a second. Just write a sec there. Um, so obviously it's going up and down, up and down constantly. So that's uh, the major difference between DC and AC. Um, is, so all these methods here will give you an output that's just constant the whole way through, whereas AC will be constantly changing. And we actually look at something called the RMS. 
Um, but I'll probably get into that next week, considering we will be doing AC next week. Yeah, but if you're if you're a little bit still confused on AC and DC, uh, there's heaps of YouTube videos online that will show you within three minutes like really good um, illustration of it, rather than me showing you now. Um, well, I've shown you this, but there is a little bit more to it. Um, but the illustrations online will be very, very good and very helpful. Um, yeah, other than that, that's uh, about it for this week. Um, if you guys want to just pop your names in the chat and then that will, I'll, I'll take the roll from there. Yeah, it looks like most of you got your name there, but I think there's a few more stragglers. Um, but yeah, just to talk about the level two again. Um, I should be finding out either tomorrow or Thursday whether we um, will be going back to night classes when level two hits. I think level two hit should be coming next week, I believe. Um, I don't know if that's for sure yet, but I think... Uh, just since I said that should be happening, um, so long as everything goes to plan. Uh, as of now, it seems like it is. Um, but yeah, from there, I think we'll be going back to night classes. But if we are, I'll try to let you guys know as soon as I possibly can. Um, I'll send another email out to everybody to let you guys know. But yeah, if there's no other questions um, or anything like that, you guys are free to go. Thanks, guys.